Looking for a guaranteed way to create content that resonates with your audience? Start a podcast, interview your ideal clients, and let them choose the topic of the interview. Because if your ideal clients care about the topic, there's a good chance the rest of your audience will care about it too. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to the B2B Growth Show, a podcast dedicated to helping B2B executives achieve explosive growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. I'm Jonathan Green. And I'm James Carberry. Let's get into the show. This episode is sponsored by Directive Consulting, the B2B search marketing agency. Okay, it's a pleasure to welcome to the show Kelly Waffle, the VP of Marketing and Partnerships at Kwanzu. Kelly, you've you've won a number of awards. You've been recognized as a leader in ABM, and this is very exciting for our audience who are in particular are interested in, in the topic of ABM and marketing in general. But you won the Marketo's Revy Award, Eloqua's Markey Award, and you're named to Analytica's Top 50 MarTech Influencers. So it's a real pleasure to have you on the show, and would love to hear a, a little bit of an introduction on what you're up to at Kwanzu. Yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me, Rex. Um, uh, I'm really excited about this. Um, at Kwanzu, uh, we've been uh, in the ABM display advertising space for the, the last couple of years. Uh, but what I'm really excited about as, as a marketer is really uh, going a lot deeper uh, beyond advertising into the world of data, metrics, and reporting, and really taking that information and making it actionable. So, uh, at Kwanzu, we do a lot of reporting uh, around our advertising campaigns. We do a lot of stuff around post-campaign uh, data and, and information. Uh, we also go in and we work with our DSPs and pull out information from their logs uh, and we're able to uh, format into uh, material and information that's actionable to our customers. So it, it's all about not just running the campaigns, but being able to collect the right information and data and being able to make decisions on that to help optimize uh, future campaigns. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting idea, taking the data you get from one and, and kind of helping to apply it to the next. That's fantastic. As you look at the way that sales and marketing are leveraging data, you were talking to me before the show here about how we could be using it better at the top of the funnel, like early, early stage in an engagement with a prospective buyer. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it's really interesting, Rex. So um, I, I've been doing some uh, research on this lately. And, uh, you know, as you had mentioned before, a lot of my background has been in, in the world of marketing automation and demand generation. And, with that, a lot of time is focused on the middle of the funnel. So going from the lead to the opportunity, and, and that's mm-hmm. where a lot of email is used. That's where a lot of uh, SDR support goes into play and, and things like that. And so there are a lot of players in that space that can help you out. What I find fascinating is a lot of people spend a tremendous amount of money at the very top of the funnel, but there's a gap between that top of the funnel and the lead stage. And, and so, you know, at, at Kwanzu, we call that uh, zero touch to lead. So that space in there where you're trying to get to the first touch, the second touch, I think a lot of buyers or potential buyers are lost. They, they drop out because you're not engaging with them properly. And part of the reason why you're not engaging with them properly is in the past, you haven't had data that you could use so that you could, you know, make actionable decisions and really customize and focus your messaging around there. But as I was telling you before, there's now technology out there that kind of enables you to glean that data. So you may not have a, a specific email address or you may not have a name of a person, but you certainly can collect a lot of anonymous information, especially in North America. Mm -hmm. around the account, what behaviors are happening from that account, uh, what geography uh, that uh, account office is in, and things like that. So you can pull in enough pieces of that. Marketing can collect enough of those pieces that they can then pass that over to uh, an SDR or BDR, 
And with very little time, they can go in and do a little bit more uh, research and and pretty much find out who that person is. Sure. And with that that? information, uh, they can go on and they can uh, uh, start an, an engagement process much sooner than they normally would. Sure. Are you using that to then prioritize the accounts that you're going after? Is that how you're leveraging it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, any of that stuff works for uh, uh, prioritization. It helps um, uh, customize the messaging because you kind of can see uh, what information, uh, you know, they're biting on and and things like that. But it really puts the the salesperson, you know, weeks, even months ahead of where they would have been if they had waited until, they've gone through the formal process of receiving a lead and and qualifying the lead at that point. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Now you mentioned this kind of from an account perspective and obviously with ABM, that's what you're thinking about is at the account level, but you know, a lot of us are thinking of this at the individual contact or lead level. How do you look at that world? What's, what's the difference and what's the most important thing for us to be focusing on? Well, I mean, to me, there, there's always going to be a mix of the two. Um, you know, I, I don't believe that um, a marketing department is going to put all of their resources into account-based marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's always going to be a mix of demand generation and a mix of uh, ABM resources. And a lot of times they're the same people. So, sure. um, but the strategies are a little bit different and you're right. So from an account-based marketing perspective, you're going to be looking at the overall accounts, you know, how many people, decision makers are within that account that you have to reach. At the same time, if you're coming at it from a demand generation point of view, you're you're going to be focused on an individual lead, an individual contact that that you can uh, build a relationship with and hopefully make them your champion and and decision maker and and move things forward. So you got to be uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit and how you uh, look at things and how you frame things. So like you said, on, on the one end, you're going to be looking at a lead. On the other end, you're going to be looking at a, 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 an opportunity. And uh, one, you're looking at an individual. And on, on the ABM side, you're looking at a collective group. Sure. Well, good. I, I think that adds some clarity there. Tell, tell us a little bit, I mean, before the interview, again, we were talking about Okay, so this is the top of the funnel. We're looking at who we're targeting, what accounts we're targeting, we're prioritizing, we're we're adding the right information. But you said, hey, when you get to the bottom of the funnel, there's some really cool technology. This is where I really want us to dig in and get some specifics. I'd love to hear some of the technologies you think can be leveraged in that a little bit further down the funnel where we're talking opportunity to close phase. Once you've generated the opportunity, you've gotten that champion, you've got somebody who who's agreed that they're interested, they're moving forward to some degree, how do we go from opportunity to close? What, what are those technologies there? Yeah. So, you know, as you know, in sales, you're, you're trying to accelerate things through the pipeline as quick as you can, but yep. uh, especially if, if you're operating, uh, you know, on enterprise deals, you, uh, you run into longer and longer sales cycles. And mm-hmm. again, uh, a lot of those decisions are, are made by a collective group of people and not one person. Uh, so, those opportunities kind of tend to stall in the pipeline. Sure. Um, and so what I'm seeing out there and, and you know, th- when I advise, you know, a lot of our customers is there's a lot of great technology out there now, uh, specialized tools that focus on that range between an opportunity and close. So these are, are uh, accounts that, that you've been working on, uh, you've, you've gotten great traction with them, but for whatever reason, you, they're not moving along. There's a, a lot of technology out there. Some of the companies that I'm thinking about are, um, there's a company out there called Clary, and there's another company called Looker, and um, I think there's one called Insight Squared. And they all uh, go out there and they focus on this area and how to help uh, the sales team accelerate that process. They're using uh, artificial intelligence um, to help uh, move things along and then also to help sales managers with their forecasting and be able to predict more accurately when that revenue is going to come into play. These are tools that I don't think are really being uh, taken advantage of today, 
But I think uh, both from a marketing perspective and a sales perspective, there are great tools for, for both groups to work on together to get a sense of how they can move things down the pipeline faster. Sure. Can you give us an idea of what that technology you know, actually does tactically? It does like everything. So, I mean, I'm kind of astounded. It really goes in there and kind of maps out everything, all the behaviors that are occurring, what behaviors should be occurring, uh, what kind of actions you should be taking. They make recommendations on things you can do. So there's a little bit, little bit of a mix of everything going on there. But I, I think it's just the concept of adding in some artificial intelligence into that process is what's been missing in the past. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I'm guessing they're, they're kind of assessing the communication back and forth between parties. Yeah, they're, they're literally assessing everything. So, you know, um, the overall orchestration. So you hear the term orchestration are used a lot on the marketing side and and how uh, to pull things together. And now they're starting to apply that to sales automation and sales functions, uh, which I think is fantastic. Because, again, every company I've been at is just um, they have been very frustrated with their ability to predict things. So even, you know, quote unquote, hot deals that are moving down the pipeline, you know, they hit a wall and they stall out for a couple of months, Mm -hmm. you know, and the the sales team, the sales managers are scratching their heads saying, I don't know what's going on here. I mean, we have that (laughs) happen at Kwan Su all the time. So, you know, having this kind of technology just provides you another perspective on, on how you can address those things. Today's growth story is all about search engine marketing. The company we're highlighting is Sentinel One. This challenger cybersecurity brand was set out to disrupt the endpoint protection space. Their brand was top-notch, their product was innovative, but they were struggling to gain traction online in an already developed industry. Then they found Directive Consulting, a B2B search marketing agency. Within the first quarter of working with Directive, Sentinel One was able to increase their organic traffic by 128% and overall lead volume by an outstanding 251%. Now, I have a hunch that Directive can get these kind of results for you too. So head over to directiveconsulting.com and request a totally free custom proposal. That's directiveconsulting.com. All right, let's get back to this interview. Yeah, that's really interesting. So we're, we're looking at things from the account level. We're looking at it as, look, this is, this is the opportunity that we're working. There's more than one person but let's zoom in, right? You get, you get all this data, all this information. We're still struggling to speak to the people at these organizations. And you and I talked a little bit about this. What's happening there. And and what do you see? Where do we need to go with this? You know, looking at just human to human as we're, as we're trying to communicate with another person, especially as you look at emails and, and how things are, it's getting harder and harder as the inbox gets more and more flooded with the technology that's made it possible for us to send, you know, millions of messages in a single click. What's what's happening there? Where we need to take it? Well, I mean, the part you just brought up is, is fantastic. It is we can't lose sight of that human to human communication. So it's it's fantastic to have the technology to to help you be more efficient and effective. But mm-hmm. uh, you you can't just be reliant on that. And I give gave a webinar yesterday uh, talking about a number of these things, and I was astounded by a couple of points. One is The research that I saw, there's 281 billion emails, (laughs) billion, 281 billion emails that are sent and received every day around the world. Wow. That's a lot of emails. So it's not a wonder that people's uh, inboxes fill up very quickly. Another point that I uh, presented yesterday was, uh, I think it came from... um, uh, serious decisions was that 48% of people uh, empty out a fair amount of their inbox every day without reading the emails within five minutes. Sure. Yeah. It's, right. the, uh, it's the little checkbox on the side where you select a bunch of them and hit delete. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, you know, I'm one of those people. So, sure. and then I read a statistic from a uh, HubSpot that uh, only 24% of sales emails are even opened. Mm -hmm. So if you're fortunate enough to have someone open your email, 
it's very important that you get to your value proposition very quickly and personalize the email as much as you can. So the, the technology today is very sophisticated and especially between a, a marketing automation platform and a CRM system, you can, you know, probably tap into 15, 20 different fields mm -hmm. from your CRM uh, system and plug them into your email to make your email very specific to that person sure. and show them that you're uh, touching on a specific pain point or you're uh, addressing their geography or you're uh, addressing a specific, you know, renewal timeline or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you need to be as specific as possible. You know, I can just tell you based on the, the sales emails that I get that, uh, a lot of salespeople are not putting that effort into it. You know, they just immediately jump into how wonderful their product is and, <laughs> you know, can, can they get a, me a meeting with me? And, yep. you know, those get deleted right away. So sure. if they come back to me and show me that they understand who I am and what my pain is, and then they can offer a solution, yes, then I'm, I'm more likely to in engage in a conversation with them. Well, now I've got to ask because there is technology that allows personalization uh, in the marketplace to a degree that I'll hold back my personal opinion on this. I'd love to hear your opinion that can tell you, you know, with automation, with the artificial intelligence, they call it, they can go into someone's online profiles and pull out information like, Hey, you're, you're a big fan. You know, I went to BYU, so I'm a big fan of the Cougars and they might use that in the subject line and in the first line of the email. Are these personal details relevant enough? Or are they as relevant? Or do you use the personalization as an icebreaker and then give a generic pitch? It sounds like you're talking more about a specific pitch to a specific problem because of you and your. Yes. Company. Yes. So it's the latter. So uh, yeah, I, I've had those kind of uh, icebreaker uh, things. Hey, I went to the same college that you mm -hmm. went to and, you know, you know, go Dukes and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and <laughs> I see right through that stuff. It, it, it has no effect on me at all. So I'm okay. talking about really spending the time. So even if it brings down the, the volume of people that you reach down a little bit, mm -hmm. I would spend a little bit more time on quality versus quantity to actually set up for the meaningful conversation and get hopefully over time a higher level of engagement than you were in the past, you were getting sure. in the past. Sure. Well, I know. I think this is some great advice. We've we've covered some good topics here from the macro and then the micro kind of human to human level. Uh, Kelly, when people want to learn more from you, more things about what you do at Quanzu, where do they find you? They can find me uh, on LinkedIn uh, at Kelly J. Waffle. Um, I have a, a fairly high number of followers on uh, Twitter. Uh, again, at, at Kelly J. Waffle, uh, I'm continually pushing out information and they can also reach me at Kelly at Kwanzu.com. Um, any of those are good channels to reach me. Very good. I'm, I'm curious, what's keeping you on Twitter? Why do you like it? What do you use it for? Because I think that's, that's one channel that some people are still equally passionate about as they've been for years and others say it's dying. You know, what, what is it that works for you? This is kind of a side note here. Uh, again, to me, you know, I, I just, uh, tend to use a variety of different channels. I don't mm -hmm. put, you know, my stock in, in any one uh, channel. So uh, I get into conversations with people on Twitter that I don't necessarily get into on, on LinkedIn or, or other channels. So uh, Twitter enables me to push out uh, a lot of uh, thought leadership mm -hmm. uh, and get connected people probably more on a, on a global basis than I do through any of the other channels. Very good. No, that's, that's excellent. Well, Kelly, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. We appreciate uh, your thoughts here. I, uh, again, thanks for inviting me and I enjoyed talking to you, Rex. I appreciate it. There are lots of ways to build a community and we've chosen to build the B2B growth community through this podcast. But because of the way podcasts work, it's really hard to engage with our listeners. And without engagement, it's tough to build a great community. So here's what we've decided to do. We're organizing small dinners across the country with our listeners and guests. No sales pitches, no agenda, just great conversations with like-minded people. 
We'll talk business. We'll talk family. We'll talk goals and dreams. We'll build friendships. So if you'd like to be a part of a B2B growth dinner in a city near you, go to b2bgrowthdinners.com. That's b2bgrowthdinners.com. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.